All right, welcome to the... Crap, what number are we on again? 146, all right. Uh, <laughs> um, welcome to the Surveillance Report 146 Q&A. This is where, for those of you who have somehow missed the memo after all this time, our patrons at $5 a month or more can ask us a question, and so far we've answered almost all of them. You guys ask really, really good questions, and we thank you for those. We got some really nuanced ones this week, so let's jump right in. We're going to start with Candroid Man, who says, I would like to start seeing a therapist. However, every therapist in network uses some sort of therapy software that would be constantly collecting data about me. Not just any, any data either, very personal patient files and things of that nature. So my choices are either get therapy and risk my data being leaked or just suck it up. I know HIPAA exists, but let's be real, it doesn't do much in the technical aspect. And even if a company does say they encrypt it, how do I know for sure? I feel stuck. I tried asking the therapist to keep my files on paper, and she said no. Um, just to be clear, I don't have any major mental health issues and I'm not suicidal or anything, but I'm trying to be healthy in a world of constant surveillance. So first of all, I'm glad to hear that you're not struggling with anything major. If you were, I would say, and I mean, even if you're not, I would say like your, your mental health, your health in general comes first. So you mentioned you tried asking the therapist and she said, no, my first question would be, have you tried other therapists? Cause you said in network. So was that the only one you asked? And she said, no, have you tried several? And they all say, no. There's kind of not much you can do here. Like you can ask them to try and use something a little bit more privacy respecting. Paper might be a little much. I could definitely understand why they wouldn't want to say yes to paper. But um, for example, you could say, hey, could we use Signal instead of, or, you know, Jitsi or something else instead of like WebEx or Zoom or whatever a lot of these therapists are using. Yeah, the problem there, I, I th this isn't from personal experience, but at least someone I know, their therapist wouldn't use Jitsi or Signal at least Signal, because Signal's not technically advertised as HIPAA compliant, by the way. I wouldn't even suggest it. It puts the therapist in a position where they might have to make a decision for something they're not familiar with. Okay, in my opinion, it doesn't hurt to ask, but Henry's right. You, you have to respect, and especially if it's not their practice, yeah, that may not be their call to make. It's a long shot, but in my opinion, I'm a, I'm a firm believer if you never ask, the answer is always going to be. You can ask. It's just I wouldn't say like, oh, well, it is HIPAA compliant because it does hit the requirements, even though it's they don't advertise themselves as HIPAA compliant. Like, that's what I wouldn't do. I, I think asking is fine, but... Okay, that's that's a fair point. Yeah, maybe maybe don't push the issue, but um, if you've only asked one person, I would definitely check a few other people and ask around. Yeah, other than that, I mean, if, if you are low income, you could look into some places have, like, um, public programs, which aren't necessarily going to be any better, but it's a new pool of people you can ask, like, hey, would you be willing to work with me and maybe do in-person visits and use paper and stuff like that? And again, I want to reiterate, if you're struggling with something serious, I've been there. I've had, like, suicidal ideations before years ago. It's definitely worth it. Like, take your health seriously, more important than privacy. But if it's just like, yeah, you know, I just want to I just want somebody who gets paid to listen to me rant about how much I hate my coworkers. Then, you know, that's your call to make. Next question is regarding food rewards. Uh, so this is when you have rewards for specific places, or maybe it's one of those ones that are shared across multiple restaurants and it shares your rewards points and things like that. They're worried about privacy, but they also want the benefits of saving money. So what would we suggest for those looking to use these apps privately? They alias as much information as they can, including email, phone, name, birthday, but they want to know if there's anything more they can do. I actually recently, as of like a week ago, I just signed up for one of these services and this is pretty much what I did. I mean, I aliased my email. I have a spam phone number that I have. It, it, took, it took a VoIP number, so it was totally easy to do. And then also the only payment method I have is something that I use with a payment aliasing service as well. Google Pay, Apple Pay stuff. So with Apple and Google Pay, they're not, I don't know about Google Pay, but with Apple Pay at least, it will actually change the card number. And so you, it's not even getting your real debit and credit card, which is really nice. So um, in that situation, for me, there's nothing really that's been correlated outside of, I guess, transactions that are spent. But when I buy the same thing at one place every week, it's pretty straightforward for me. So it really just depends on what your privacy concern is. So definitely ask what the concern is and what you're able to mitigate. And if you can't mitigate all your concerns, then you're just gonna have to pass on the rewards. But it is possible to do this pretty easily. I mean, they don't really ev ever need real information for this kind of stuff. So just a quick note, because that's like the second or third time we've been unsure. I'm on Google's safety.google slash pay, which is supposed to give you information about how Google is protecting your privacy and security. And surprisingly, it doesn't just say LOL, but it does pop up with an annoying little chat bot that I wish would go away. 
they point out here, contactless payments are more secure because merchants won't receive your real card number and Google Pay uses a virtual account number that protects your payment info. So I don't know if it's like a unique card number every time, but they are right about that. If you use like the, the tap or um, even the chip, I think it generates a temporary card number every time that's issued by the bank. So the bank knows who you are, but the vendor gets a different card number. We're getting too into the weeds of that. So in addition to the aliasing thing, my thought here is actually shared around. Like if you've got friends and family who also shop at that place, especially if they're in other states, I know your actual purchase data can be tied back to you like a, uh, in, in terms of like a pattern. If you're the only one using that reward card, then it kind of creates a pattern of purchases. But if you've got like your mom and your best friend and you know, your, your partner and like multiple people using it and it's just more rewards. One thing Michael Basil suggests, there was an old eighties pop song, eight, six, seven, five, three, oh, nine. Try that with your area code or like one of the dominant area codes. If you live in a city that has multiple area codes, there's probably already at least one or multiple accounts with that phone number. Just put it on there, especially if you don't care about like, well, I guess if you're signing up for it, then you, you probably do care about using the rewards. But so yeah, in that case, I would say just, um, try to share it with like friends and family who may not necessarily care about the rewards, but don't mind using it to help you get the rewards. Going back to the eight, six, seven thing. Like if you're just trying to save a few bucks, if it's one of those things where like, Oh, you get the reduced price. If you have the rewards card, just try that number. It probably works. Our next question. What services do you use or consider using for non-disposable email aliases? Simple login is convenient, but in firewalls, don't stop dragons. Carrie Parker recommends using services only for accounts. You don't care much for enough for important ones like bank accounts. Seems like a valid concern because losing access to email sent to an alias is important. and does not sound fun. Of course, aliasing companies could get acquired or go out of business. His other recommendation is to buy a custom domain and link it to a private service like proton or two to While that also seems solid, it would appear to add another very clear way to connect your accounts across the web since no one but you would be using it unless you generate a different domain, at which point you're rapidly having a hard track managing them, becomes really expensive. Okay, I wanna address that one first because I have a theory here and if I'm wrong, someone please correct me. I strongly suspect that having a custom domain only makes you stand out if you're being targeted because here's my logic. Most people, this is a statistic. I wrote a whole blog post about this. I'll see if I can find it. We can throw it in show notes. Most people have more than one email address because most people have caught on by now. They have one that they use for important things like friends and family, applying for jobs, things like that. And then they have one that they use for garbage, like signing up for Facebook and newsletters and getting that discount at Chili's and whatnot. Most people also use Gmail or Yahoo or maybe AOL. There's like only a handful of providers. So statistically speaking, if I have a thousand people and 990 of them are using the same three providers, it does not make any sense for me to monitor that specific domain. The email address itself, it makes sense. If I see bob1990 at gmail.com and I see that same email in multiple places, it's probably the same person. If I see gmail.com in multiple places, it's probably not the same person. So if you're using the same custom domain everywhere, but you're using like a different, like, you know, doctor at mydomain.com and then bank at mydomain.com. I think it's extremely unlikely that these companies are looking at the domain specifically. I think they're looking at the entire email address. Again, that does not apply if you're being targeted. If you're being targeted by the NSA, they're absolutely looking at the domain. That's my personal theory. Again, someone please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think there's any risk, again, unless you're being targeted from just using a custom domain. That said, what I like to do is I use a custom domain with simple login. If simple login ever goes under, I point it somewhere else. I point it at addy.io. I point it at, you know, Proton Mail. I point it somewhere else. Something else, just, just to add on here, you can import your custom domain into Proton, Tutanota, simple login, and all three of them, you can still use their own domains as well. You know, when you create a Proton account, you can have your Henry at Proton.me account, and you can also have your Henry at Henry.com, both in the same inbox. So it's not either or, you can just have the option to have a custom domain with one of these providers. And same thing with Simple Login. Even if you use Simple Login with a custom domain, you still have access to the Simple Login domain as well. So you can actually pick and choose when to use the custom domain. Uh, just something to throw your way. Yeah, but his concern was more like when you start using a custom domain for the important things, it, if you if you do it in Proton Mail, it starts adding up because that's a new email address every time. Right. You know, if you're down to just a few services, I don't think it's a big deal to use the same email for those few services. 
if you're talking like you have three bank accounts, all of them already have your real information because they're important bank accounts. I don't see a big issue with having one email that you use for your banking, but it really just depends how compartmentalized you want to go. I just wouldn't overthink this too much. I, I think that just uh, emails can get really messy really quickly. And I would say that just doing the, the basics is going to take you the furthest here. And then you're going to get pretty quick diminishing returns if you're going to try to have like a custom domain for every important account or something crazy like that. Patron called Barnaby asks, since a bit more than a year, Samsung camera app requires access to nearby devices to function. It won't launch if you don't give the permission. Shout out to all the people who said Samsung devices weren't terrible. <laughs> um, do you have... I saw that. That was wild. Right. A lot of you really like Samsung phones, and I just hard disagree. But the question is, do you have any camera app to recommend that would be privacy respecting? You know, I think the most common thing you're going to hear from a lot of people is probably open camera from F-Droid. That's what I was just thinking. It's very powerful. It does pretty much everything you need it to, but it's very, 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 very rough around the edges. I mean, it is one ugly app. And I don't mind if the developer hears that. Like, it's an ugly app, man. But it's it's a powerful app and it gets the job done. So I think that's what most people are going to suggest. Um, there are other just basic camera applications as well in F-Droid. I would suggest simple camera, right? Just like simple camera. So I would. I know I've I've never used it myself, but I know a lot of people say simple makes a really good suite of of tools. So no, I've heard good stuff about simple too, and um, and it, just download F-Droid and search for camera. I think simple camera and then also open camera are probably two good ones to check out. There's also one camera made by a, a certain operating system that doesn't like us, so we're not going to name them, but it's on the Play Store, and that's an option if you're interested. The nice thing about that one is it strips the metadata from your photos by default, so that's pretty cool. And the last question comes from, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that name, it's some kind of Nordic name, it says, uh, thanks for the channel, I recently became a patron, so thank you. We're glad to have you here, even if I can't pronounce your name. You say, I'm slowly going forward with my uh, integrity and security improvements and have come to the camera on my Windows computer. Camera questions today. I use it for logging in with Windows Hello. It works really well and is user friendly, but I don't like having it turned on the whole time when I'm using the computer. I've been thinking about using my fingerprint to log in, but my computer doesn't have a reader. So my question is, I've seen there are small USB sticks, which are fingerprint readers that you can buy. I don't know if there are any issues with such hardware. When I am moving from Windows to Linux, will there be other problems? Because, you know, of course it's cheaper to use your current computer, assuming it's not outdated, rather than buying a new one just to have that fingerprint reader. I'll be honest, I cannot speak to the USB sticks. Are there issues? Probably. I mean, just being honest, you know, there's anytime you introduce a new software, hardware, anything, there's probably going to be issues. Are they major issues? Probably not. I'd, I would try to find ones that... I guess have a good privacy policy that don't say anything about, you know, some software included that are probably not phoning home. My other thought, why does the camera have to be turned on the whole time? Do you know anything about that? I don't. It, Is that just like it locks if you step away or something? I don't know if it's active the whole time or if they're, if they just mean like the camera is there, there. the whole time. I, I, I don't, yeah. I'm not quite sure. I don't use windows. Hello. Um, so. I'm not a good person. Yeah, I don't use it either. If it doesn't have to be active the whole time, I would say just get like a little camera cover like from EFF and then you can just slide it open when you need to log in and slide it closed after you're logged in. Or again, unless it's like one of those things where if you walk away, it knows it and it won't work if you cover it. My other thing would be, I would look into a YubiKey to be totally honest because I know those are compatible with Windows Hello and then you also get the advantage of having the hardware two-factor, which is virtually unhackable. Nothing is truly unhackable, but it's a huge step up. That's that's what I would do on it. That would be my first suggestion, to be totally honest, is look into a YubiKey because if you have the money, they're only like 50 bucks USD and you get so much more in return for getting one. You could even get a BioSeries. series. it would also solve your Windows Hello issue. Yeah, you could get the Bio series, which requires your fingerprint to activate. So you're getting the best of all worlds there and they're a trusted company. So only sucky thing about the Bio series is you can't use that same key on your mobile devices, but... If you have like multiple keys, that's fine. Yeah, I don't have anything else to add there. It's a pretty niche question for, I think, something neither of us are it was. Have, but my very much uh, familiarity with. So, But it was an interesting question. I like it. I like these, uh, these questions that make you think. Yeah, if you have a question that you think will make us think, go ahead and sign up for Patreon, $5 a month or more, and maybe we will ask your question on the next surveillance report. 
Thank you guys for watching and stay tuned for Surveillance Report 147 this coming weekend.